Christ. The marriage is with Christ and the church. Right? Okay. Tell me then that, okay, I'm a man and Christ is a man. So a man and a man can marry. You're lost anyway. Just like these Sadducees. Okay? You're lost. Okay? You're lost. Just like the Sadducees. And tell me then that a woman and a woman can marry. Okay? Okay? You're lost. You see? You're lost. Okay? You're lost. You don't understand what God instituted in the beginning and you still don't understand what is to come because what is here is a figure of what is to come and God is saying that even though I am a male right now but in the resurrection I'm going to lose my masculinity my malehood I'm going to lose all of that and if you're a woman you're going to lose your womanhood. All of those things. And God is going to bring you up. Up to the level of an angel. And you see what has been happening in this world. Is that Satan has been very busy in the matter of sex. They use pornography. Um, um, these pedophiles and, and drugs and all these things. And... Uh, are these things they've been using, right? To enslave people. And it is so bad that evil spirits themselves take on the form of man, of mankind, right? Take on the form of flesh and blood and get into sexual acts. And a lot of this thing is going on. And the devil is using sex to enslave the world. And so it is right now. Um, so, so, and, 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 and this is one of the reasons why I said, even with pornography, for example, right? Sometimes I get a lot of these friend requests from these women. And, and to many men, they would say like, oh, you know, these women look good. You better close your eyes. Because what you see looking like is a woman could very well be a devil from hell. Don't mess with them. Don't mess with them. Don't mess with them at all. You know, don't mess with them. Have nothing to do with them. Okay? Have nothing to do with them. Have nothing to do with them. You see, because what you're thinking is a human being could very well be a demon from hell that you're looking at. And I know you won't be able to tell the difference because God doesn't even have to give you the vision to know which is which because that's the devil's ground already, right? So don't even tread on the devil's ground. Don't go over there at all. Stay away from the devil's ground. It might look beautiful, it might look attractive. Stay away from the devil's ground. Okay? Don't expect that you can always go anywhere and of course God will always be with you. It doesn't work that way. If you think that then, I will tell you the same thing as the Bible said. You do err not knowing the scriptures. Right? You see it in the Bible. Right? I was talking... Um, to a co-worker this week about something that happened in the, in the time of David's life. How he, he is the brother raped the sister. Right? And I was telling her why. Every time I think about it. Because the Bible said that David was, was a time when kings go to battle. He was supposed to be on the battlefield. If he was there, the devil couldn't find that, I wouldn't trap him like that. But because he stayed home, I guess he said to himself, I don't really have to go. My army is bad enough, they can, they can handle it. I don't have to go, right? So he stayed home. And then the devil found work for him. 
that damned him in a pit where, I mean, he was crying out to God for help. And even though God forgave him, it created a, a whole kingdom went this away after that. Because there was a price to pay for the error that he made and shed man's blood. Now, if he was on the battlefield where he was supposed to be, then, I mean, Satan would have been scared of him down there, right? As he normally was. He said, he would have been scared of him. He said, what? David's on the battlefield? There's trouble, right? Because God is with him. But now David stays away from the battlefield and God is just watching him. Let me see what he's doing. Because this is not where I, I want it to be. It's not where I want it to be. So all of this thing was, went on like that. All this thing went on like that. He said to himself, but how could that happen to a man of God? Okay, you're trending on the devil's ground. Okay? You're not where God wants you to be. And if you were where God wanted you to be, then God would have been there with you. So don't just get into anything and just say, well, God is always be with me. Because sometimes, you know, the, the God will just tell the angel, just, just stand back and watch him. That's what he's going to do. Because that's not what I told him to do. So you're on your own really now. If you're not doing what God tells you to do, then of course you're on your own now. So you're, you're, you, and, and, and of our own selves, we can't, we are no match for the devil, as my dad used to say. We can't fight these devils, which for thousands of years have been destroying people and set, sending them around to hell. We can't fight them, right? We need him to be with us. We need the Holy Ghost to be with us. And so we can't afford to make such blunders, right? So as I said to you, don't just say, well, I'll go, because... And they said, um, some people go to places where angels fail to tread. Not that angels are fear, but the angels know, well, this is not my territory. If you want to go in there, you go in there on your own. I'm not going there with you. Okay? But David was right in his very own house. It was fine for him to be in his house. It was fine for him to go up on the balcony. But nothing wrong with all of that. Because that's his own balcony as his house. But it was not the right time. It was not the time for him to be at home. Okay? And so the devil found work for him. That caused trouble in his family and his life right until the end. Okay? So I'm saying this that, you know, people are so crazy over the things of this life. Okay? You want, you say what the best things. Okay, God is supposed to give you a car. Right? But God is telling you that there's going to come a need, a time when there'll be no need for a car. You know, there's a scripture here, I didn't put it in, but it was in my arm, my thought. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we love to read that chapter to talk about the love chapter. But hear what Paul says here. He's talking about the things of this life and even the best of the things of this life. And he said here, verse 8, he said, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Because a time will come when there will be no more need to prophesy, and there will be no more need to look for a prophecy to be fulfilled, because all the prophecies would have been fulfilled. That's why when Jesus was on the cross and um, he cried out, say he touched, they gave him vinegar mingled with God to drink with his sup. And, and he tasted it. And then he said, it is finished. What did he mean by it's finished? The same thing here. All the prophecies concerning my life when I have to come here are failed. There's nothing more to happen. Nothing more. Everything was prophesied. There was nothing more to happen again. And then the Bible said, he dropped his head like this and died. And he said, death, okay, you can hold on to me now. 
until I'm ready to come back. Bow his head and die. And he stayed on the cross. Right? With all his bleeding and all his shit, blood, lots of blood and all of that he was doing. Until all of those prophecies could be fulfilled. And, and that came to that point, prophecies failed. No more prophecy to be fulfilled. They are done. No more to come. They are all done. As far as his life here on earth is concerned. But there will come a time for this world just like that. When there will be no more need to prophesy. And all the prophecies concerning this life will have failed. There will no more need for it. Done. That's what the Bible said. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. And even speaking in tongues and these gifts of the Spirit, he said there's no need for them anymore. We're not taking them into the resurrection. Right? He said whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. And whether there should be knowledge, shall vanish away. So all of the things you're trying to know now, to get degrees and even to study the Word of God and know all of these things, there's no need for them. There's no need for them. At the time of the resurrection, when you are now brought back from that point of degradation, and the Lord raises you up now to the level of angel, made us a little lower than the angels, right? And in truth and in fact, we're going down, 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 right? And when the Lord bring us back up to the level of the angels, all of these things mean nothing. Because these things that we strive after, do they mean anything to an angel? You think an angel needs a, a, a BMW or a, a, a Bentley to move around? I mean, the angels look at these things as, as little, little foolish things that are moving around on the earth, right? The Bible tells you in Daniel, what is it, chapter 9, I think what it said that when, when Daniel knelt down to pray and he was making his confession, he said, before he finished, the angel Gabriel came and touched him and said, Daniel, get up, get up, man greatly beloved. God, the Almighty sent me to you. He heard your prayer and he sent me to you. The Bible says he flew swiftly. Can you imagine? There was nothing on earth that could even imagine the speed at which the angel was moving. Right? That before he could finish his prayer, the angel was there. Right? And so the, do, do you think the angel needs your knowledge? Our limited knowledge, which we can't explain things like fear and death and pain and all these manner of things that which happen around us, which they understand. You think that angels need these things? That's one of the reasons why we are such a disadvantage with Satan and his angels. Because because of our angels, they know a lot of stuff that we don't know or will never know unless we get to that point of the resurrection and be translated. We'll never know it. Right? So they took all of that knowledge with them into, into rebellion, okay? But it's not going to stop them from being destroyed. But I'm saying to you, we have no knowledge compared to angels, okay? Nothing. Nothing. What is our knowledge? And what are these things that we have that we glory in, right? Our clothes that we wear, maybe you said they are so expensive. But Adam didn't need those clothes when he was made. Okay? If, if things were as they were when Adam was made, we wouldn't need them. Okay? And so, we are glorying in things that of this life that absolutely mean nothing. Make an airplane, what is that? When I'm flying in an airplane, I ask the Lord to send an angel with an aircraft. That we just hold it and just take it where it's going. What's that? that? Because the angel can just hold on to the aircraft like that, like his hand and just fly with it. It's like when we're children, we make our um, child plane and we do like this. The angel hold it like an aircraft his hand and just take it to where it's going and, and put it down. And the pilot is there, he doesn't know that the angel is carrying it because God's child is in it or God's people are in it. 
Okay? That's what angels can do. So all these things, I mean, now there's a life which, I mean, you know, you think it's such a, a big deal. What is that compared to what God has promised? And even then, you know, the Bible said, Methuselah lived 969 years, and then he said what? And then he, he died. So even if you live almost to a thousand years, then that's come this thing about you died. And that's the end of it. What about the sicknesses that come along the way? The pains that we have, right? Different issues of our skin sagging and getting wrinkled and, and um, all the headaches of life, all of these things. Why is it you don't want to sell them out for the kingdom of God? And when I'm talking this, think I'm talking to people who are, as they say, are sinners. I'm talking to people who are in the church. Right? Because, because they're, they're still holding on to these things. Waiting that, well, as long as they can stay and, you know, and eventually they will get into the home of God. Yeah, but how are you going to get in the home without you being married? You have to be the bride. And you have to make the preparation, as I said last week. Go all out. Anything that he asks you to do to make yourself ready. Go all out. Right, go all out. You will never be the bride unless you get to the wedding. So all of these things we live in now is a figure. Okay? As I told you, yes. I got the certificate myself. So your name is now written in heaven and you're not married to Christ and all these things. All of these things are just in a figure. Okay? It's not going to become a reality unless we get to that wedding the bride of Christ. So, John said, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. So, he has a home there for us. He has, he has a home. Right? Because all the people who don't accept his home will be banished from the home. We were banished. Don't think he's going to have, um, you know, like you're going to have a slum area here uh, and a posh area here and all that sort of thing. No. There'll be no slum area, no posh area, no middle class area, low class area, and um, slum and, and, um, and up in the hills and all that. No, no, no. The whole thing. The Bible said the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven, Daniel 7, shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Right? Isn't that what the scripture said? Daniel 7, verse 27. And the kingdom and dominion, and the greatness of the kingdom, under the whole heaven, shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. And today a lot of us are arguing about like, who is the right church and who is doing this and who is doing that. All because of what is written in your creed. But what is written in your creed means nothing to God enough. What is written in your creed means nothing. It's what you're living is what means something to him. That's a testimony. As Jesus said, there were two sons and, and the master said to him, he said, the father said, go work in my vineyard. He said, no, I'm not going anywhere, right? And the other one said, yes, I will go. The one who said, yes, you will go, didn't go. The one who said he wouldn't go, afterwards said, you know, I really shouldn't disrespect my daddy like that, I'm going to go. So he asked, you know, so which one really went? And did the will of his fa father. It's the one who actually said no at first, because what? He actually changed his mind and went. Okay, so this is today, that's what Jesus was doing. A lot of people who, as John said, they were saying, we have Abraham to our father, and we have this, and we have this connection, and we have this connection. He said, no, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Right? 
What I want, every tree that bring it not for good fruit, I'm going to cut it down and cast it in the fire. I don't care who is connected to and who is not connected to. It doesn't matter. Right? And this thing with the Pharisees, the Sadducees were so bad that, that Jesus said to them, I do you know that not God is the God of the living and not of the dead? Right? So it, that's why he said Abraham was the God of Abraham. Then Abraham died. Before he died, he went into Isaac. He continued with Isaac before he, Isaac died. He went to Jacob. And he went to all these patriarchs coming with Moses. So God does not abide with the dead. So the whole idea of them bringing up a story like this, Jesus was saying it was so absurd. Right? Okay? So, 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 and, and, and when he said in the resurrection, they are changed. They changed. Right? They changed. And so many people, so God has prepared a home for us. And I want us to look at um, the, the scripture in, in John said, he said, let not your heart be troubled. He said, believe in God, you believe in God, believe in me. In my Father, there are many mansions. His disciples asked him one time, he said, we have left all and followed you. What shall we have? And he told them, you shall have in this life lands and all these things with tribulation and persecution, he said. But in the world to come, you shall have everlasting life. And focus your attention on that. Because that's the time when there will be no more persecution, no more trouble, no more sin. And let's go back to, back to Revelation 21, right? And the scripture said here, he said, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. I'm telling you, if there's even that alone should make you want to exchange this life for the life to come. And I'm saying this to people who are Christians. I'm not even saying that people are that even saved. Because people who are Christians, they don't want Jesus to come. And as the preacher said, God has to slap them sometime for them to realize that this is not where he wants them to be. But no, he shouldn't have to still be slapping you with trials and tribulations for you to realize that. Right? Because your love for the bridegroom is supposed to keep you focused. Right? And so when God is slapping you, he's at work trying to get you in the street and narrow, like a horse with a bitter bridle. And you better learn to go in the street and narrow. Okay? I'm telling you, man. So we have not been faithful to God. We have not been faithful to our bridegroom. Some of the things that we have thought about, saying that, yeah, I want to do this, man, if Jesus should just wait a while until I come, and, and don't come right now, so I can get this done. But what is he going to do for you? What is he going to do for you? Right? And then now when you get it now, you say you want to enjoy. Okay, and you want to enjoy until the rest of your life. So where is God going to find any place to come? Because as my father said, if everybody, Jesus wants to wait on people to come, he wouldn't come because it would never be right for anybody. Because there are always somebody who said not right yet. But look at the things that he has promised. God shall wipe away all tears from our eyes. There shall be no more death. Imagine that. I guess if you're a man with a mortician, are you in the funeral business? You're going to say, no, 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 I, no, 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 no. You're going to put me out of money, I can't. What? Nobody going to die? Then I'm out of business. Yeah, you know who's out of business too? Satan. Yeah. The architect want to kill people. He's out of business. People who are behind this coronavirus thing. They're out of business. You understand? 
Doctors are out of business. Hospitals are out of business. Okay? No more sorrow. No more crying. Not that shall there be any more pain. For the former things that passed away. Right? They're out of business. So people who um, are making money out of this life or they feel comfortable here. They want it to continue the way it is. But God is saying, all of this is just a figure, right? Passing through. And I'm going to straighten things out. You better straighten out yourself. Because I'm saying, if you're there saying to yourself, oh, I don't want Jesus to come yet. What do, what do you hope to achieve if Jesus does not come? If he wait until tomorrow, how is it going to benefit you? If he waits until next year, how is it going to benefit you? If he waits another 10 years, how is it going to benefit you? Not to mention the fact that you don't even know if you live to see tomorrow. Think about that. And, and you know, that thing baffles me when I see people who don't serve God enough. Because I, I wonder to myself, people who go to bed night after night, just on a whim, just hoping that, well, I wake up tomorrow. Because even me, as a child of God, I'm going to bed and I'm anticipating that I wake up tomorrow, but I know it's in the will of God. Right? I'm conscious of that. But how do people live that way? You know? No, no consolation from heaven. No consolation from God. They just go to bed and just say, well, when I wake up tomorrow, I do this or when I wake up, which might just never happen. Right? So I'm saying to you, if, if you're waiting, want Jesus to wait until tomorrow, until next year, or 10 years, what do you hope to accomplish? But suppose you live the 10 years. You know how much sorrow you're going to have within that 10 years? You will have crying too. And you will have pain. All of those things will be in that 10 years. Okay? And you will have suffering. No matter who you are. You could be in the palace. Right? You will have these things within that 10 years. Okay? You will have disappointment. Heart breaks. You will have people will betray you, will have um, all manner of things going to happen to you in that 10 years. And at the end of the t those 10 years, okay, what is it going to do for you? If you, if you have a mansion, what is it going to do for you? Because the mansion that Christ has prepared is not what we have here today. He doesn't need anything from you. So you can't take it over to him and say, well, Lord, you know, I don't need one of your mansion because I already have one. No way. No way. It's not going to happen. Alright? Hold on. Um, I don't need a chariot because I already have a Bentley. I have a Rolls Royce. And the Lord will say, you do error, not knowing the scripture. Like in the figure, I say like, like, let you know that in the life to come, we don't use Bentleys. We don't use wheels. Okay? We don't have streets. Black top, black top streets. In the life to come, we have streets of gold. That's what we have. And there's nobody to rub them out where they have to have potholes and all those things. There is none of those things. They don't, they don't exist. Right? God shall, and the scripture said, the former things, the things that were before, are gone. Can you imagine that? And he said, and he that sat upon the throne, verse 5, said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these, these words are true and faithful. That means you can, you can put your life on it. Put the whole of your life on it. Without reservation. The whole of your life you can put on, on this word. This word. This word. The scripture said. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, he said, verse 6, 